Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, another national restaurant chain says its pork suppliers will have to phase out the use of sow gestation crates. Mississippi State University is training National Guard troops at Camp Shelby in agriculture so they can help farmers in Afghanistan. And today's Southern Gardening will visit a man who turned an eyesore into eye candy in his landscape. In the markets, Pond Bank catfish prices fall as a short supply situation helps hogs. In the feature segment, we'll have a Farm Week flashback. We'll go back to 2003 when we profiled Harris Barnes of Clarksdale, Mississippi. Barnes was a well-known agricultural journalist, photographer, and a hard worker who published three books in his 80s. So I was amazed that some of them would give me $25 or $50 for a black and white print. I was, you might say, moonlighting on some of my jobs as farm managers because I was writing in the thick of it and every time I saw a good picture I'd try to capture it. So thank the Lord I started saving pictures back in 46. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. Another national restaurant change has announced a new animal welfare policy. Leighton Sonic is the nation's largest drive-in restaurant chain. Like other national restaurants such as McDonald's, Sonic announced this week its pork suppliers will have to phase out the use of individual gestation crates for sows. Sonic says it hopes to do this no later than 2022, but it says it may be able to accomplish that in five years. Several large pork suppliers have indicated they will transition by then to so-called group housing. Sonic says it also plans to phase in the use of cage-free eggs. The Mississippi State University Extension Service is sending a wealth of agricultural knowledge along with soldiers as they prepare to assist ag operations in Afghanistan. The purpose is to increase trust between Afghan locals and their government and hopefully help farming families to make more money. National Guard personnel were trained in various practices ranging from irrigation to food preservation to livestock management. Farm Week's Amy Taylor reports from Camp Shelby. As part of the Mississippi Agricultural Business Development Team, these military personnel experienced a different kind of boot camp. Colonel Burt Gilmore says to help build an ag market in Afghanistan, troops are being trained by various MSU Extension personnel. We're here today to, to just observe some of the vegetable growing opportunities, the vineyards that are here at the Beaumont Experiment Station. We get to see some real life stuff going on, uh, you know, with the drip irrigation and the vegetable uh, site over there. It was certainly interesting and we kind of can see maybe how we might be able to improve on some of their demonstration farms in Afghanistan. The greenhouse that's down there, certainly a, a lot of ideas run through my head as to how we can uh, maybe take some of our technology to Afghanistan. Colonel Gilmore says the team of troops does come from an ag background. Sergeant Gregory Reed says MSU Extension plays a crucial role in assisting the Afghan Ministry of Agriculture. The Extension program is a program that is now and forever will be needed because the education consistently changes, technology consistently changes, and the Extension program is designed to bring the university to the people. So you got all of these subject matter specialists and people with all these various needs and you help them develop programs, plans and situations that would be more tailor fitted to their specific needs. In addition, Extension Urban Horticulturist Christine Coker describes the knowledge she shared such as vineyard maintenance. We talked about some pruning and maintenance of vineyards. We also talked about high tunnel production, which is basically an unheated greenhouse that can be used for season extension. Uh, we also talked about plasticulture 
and drip irrigation and maybe how to overcome some of the irrigation issues that they have in Afghanistan because of their water issues. During the training, troops visited various farms and MSU extension facilities located in South Mississippi. I'm Amy Taylor reporting. Well, do you have an ugly eyesore in your landscape? In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman shows us how creativity and ingenuity can transform it into something beautiful. Almost every landscape has an ugly spot that you try to hide. Today we're going to show you one idea for turning a landscape eyesore into beautiful eye candy. This particular house has an old stump along the driveway that would be expensive to remove or grind up. Instead of just living with the problem, my friend Jerry turned this ugly stump into an attractive planter. Here's how. Jerry started by removing some rotten wood along the top edge of the stump. He wanted the planter to have a rustic look, so he chose some strips of old scrap tin as the building material. By attaching several tin strips all the way around the edge of the stump, they formed a big bowl to serve as a planter. This particular site is away from the house and water supply, so drought tolerance was a consideration in choosing plants. He used a good commercial potting mixture with moisture control to serve as the growing media. Jerry also wanted to use the proven thriller, filler, and spiller formula to design an attractive mixed planter. Red Penicetum was chosen as the thriller plant to provide tall, colorful interest. For the filler plants, Jerry selected some New Gold and Desert Sunset Lantana to provide some color and additional greenery. And finally, he put in some sweet potato vine to spill over the edges and provide a cascading effect. To finish the project off, some Liriope and Confederate Jasmine was planted along the bottom edge of the stump. In the end, an eyesore was turned into eye candy by adding some plants, recycled scrap material, and a good idea. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Gary says use your imagination to turn that less attractive area into an asset. And he did. In the feature segment today, Harris Barnes of Clarksdale, Mississippi. His camera recorded the changes and the modernization of American yes. agriculture. And, and the well-known agricultural journalist published three books of his photographs. Time now for the markets with Layton, and Layton, a new cattle on feed report is out. That's right, artists trading in the beef sector rather cautious in advance of the, that release Friday afternoon the 22nd. Also ahead this week, U.S. catfish supplies are up and prices are down. More and heavier cattle are being put in the nation's feedlots, while demand for ethanol declines. A brand new snapshot of the nation's farm-raised catfish industry was released on Wednesday afternoon by the USDA. These numbers reflect conditions in the month of May. The average pond bank price paid to U.S. producers was $1.04 per pound. That is down 12 cents per pound from April and is 13 cents per pound below where we were one year ago. Farm sales, meanwhile, totaled 25 million pounds round weight, an increase of 1% from May 2011. Processor sales were just shy of 13.5 million pounds. That is an increase of 6% from one year ago. Ahead of the Friday the 22nd on feed report, analysts at Allendale Incorporated were calling for big jumps for both cattle placements and marketings. The cash cattle market has experienced somewhat of a setback recently with supplies growing and weights growing also. Analyst Sue Martin provided this commentary on what's going on in the beef sector. I think that uh, when you've come into summer and we've got the number of imports coming in. Imports are greater than they were a year ago. Mm -hmm. uh, in the meantime, yes, we maybe have less numbers than a year ago, but we're carrying a lot more weight than a year ago in cattle. And so I think that that's picking up some of the slack. And then you've got uh, gasoline prices, which maybe have ebbed down a little bit. But uh, the consumer is strapped and has to cut corners. And I think that demand has been kind of jeopardized a little bit. So I think that uh, maybe in another week or so here, the cattle market peaks and we start to see another tail off as we go in through July towards August. Uh, the better time, I think, for cattle will be more December into January, February of next year. 
Continuing in livestock, the hog market is having quite the opposite experience from what you just saw described for cattle. Analyst Darren Newsom is even of the opinion that the pork sector is in for a bullish period. We've actually got a short supply situation. We've got packers really pushing this market. We had very strong cash markets. It looks like we want to stick with this for a little while. We've, we've, we've turned the trend of the cash market up. I think it's going to continue to pull the futures market as well. So, you know, where, where the cattle industry looks bearish, at least for short term, looks like it's uh, going to be quite bullish for hogs. And we look to forestry for our trivia quiz this week. And here's the question you need to answer. What type of pine tree stands produce a higher percentage of poles? Pick your answer from these three choices, loblolly pine, slash pine, or longleaf pine. We'll tell you the correct response in a few minutes. We're going to pause for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar in the second part of the markets, latent span reports on the supply demand report, and problems with ethanol demand. In the feature segment today, a Farm Week flashback segment on Harris Barnes of Clarksdale, Mississippi. Barnes started off farming, but eventually found his career in ag journalism and photography. Our tradition of learn by doing is creating new opportunities. My 4-H is involved with service projects in communities all across our state. We develop leaders for Mississippi's future. My 4-H is science and technology, everything from computers and robotics to exploring our environment. My 4-H promotes active lifestyles and encourages physical fitness, healthy foods, and nutrition. My 4-H is Mississippi 4-H. Before we get back to the markets, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. Can I still make money growing trees? It's a forestry workshop that will be held Thursday evening, June 28th. The location is the East Mississippi Electric Power Association office on Highway 39 North at Meridian. You'll learn about the timber market outlook and where to possibly find government cost share assistance for planting. 2012 North Mississippi Grazing School is Friday, June 29th. The location is Mississippi State University's North Mississippi Research and Extension Center. That's on Highway 145 at Verona. Rotational grazing, electric fencing, financial assistance programs for grazing, hay and beef cattle marketing will be on the program. There's no registration fee, but you do need to register as soon as possible. We'll have the contact information on the Farm Week calendar and Facebook page. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week snapshot. Some U.S. analysts are saying we are experiencing a weather-driven market, especially in soybeans. Extension economist John Michael Riley joined me Thursday morning to discuss corn and beans and the recent supply-demand report for the month of June. John Michael, Thursday morning, U.S. grain futures down some due to forecasts of maybe a better chance of rain up in parts of the Corn Belt. This is really a weather market now, isn't it? It, it really does uh, ebb and flow as the weather goes. It's uh, constantly sitting under the potential of a rain cloud, and that's what we're dealing with today. We've been dealing with that for actually, you know, the past number of weeks, if not, if not over the month and month and a half. It seems like as, as weather projections come in for rain across the Corn Belt, the market goes down and uh, vice versa. So we really are in a weather market because it is uh, the crop got planted early. It's at a very critical stage, both soy corn and soybeans at, the, at this point in time. So weather is very important to the crop. Um, so that's, that's really why we are in that, that stage. And we forget sometimes, even though we may have had some recent showers in the Mid-South, that's not the case uh, in, in the Corn Belt and other parts of the Midwest. You're right. Uh, Mississippi's production counts for less than 1% of the corn crop and roughly 2 to 2.5% 2 of the soybean crop. So we are really a drop in the bucket on the, from the national scale, and that's why it is focused on the Corn Belt. Well, let's talk a little bit about the supply demand report that came out for the month of June. From your point of view, any real surprises in there? Uh, the markets are a big surprise on the corn uh, with, with respect to corn. They were really looking for all these weather uh, 
factors that have been taking place to pull down the yield per acre. Uh, USDA didn't change that from the previous uh, projection of 166 bushels an acre, which is uh, slightly above trend, but uh, the, the market was looking for that to be down a little bit due to these, these weather concerns. Um, but it is going to be interesting to see how that progresses. Soybeans are actually tight, tighter than, than the market expected, so we really saw uh, corn move one way and soybean go the other when the report was released. Now, uh, in about another week, June 29th, that could be a, a market moving day. We've got two major reports coming out that day. What, what are your expectations that uh, we may see some? I some expect movement? it to. I expect it to to move the market. Uh, uh, we've there's a lot of talk about with the wheat crop getting harvested so quickly. There's going to be some uh, double crop beans coming in behind wheat, but this this dry weather across the Corn Belt is is going to play heavy in whether or not that takes place and whether or not it has taken place. Um, and so we'll maybe might see some more acres on soybean side, but again, it's weather driven. And then there's a lot of expectation that because the corn crop got planted so early, there were more acres went to corn uh, than were projected in the earlier uh, prospective planting report. So it's going to really be interesting to see what happens. But between now and then, probably just be uh, sideways movement here waiting on those reports. It goes as the weather goes. Extension economist John Michael Riley. Well, high corn prices and a surplus of ethanol are producing negative margins for the ethanol industry. And as a result, at least one ethanol plant in Nebraska is temporarily suspending production and more plants could follow suit. The Renewable Fuels Association president, Bob Deneen, says as gasoline usage continues to decline, the demand for ethanol falls as well. The RFA also says that export demand for U.S. made ethanol is weaker in this year of 2012, which is another challenge for that industry. Well, let's take a quick look at our trivia answer as we wrap up the markets for this week. The correct answer is C. Longleaf pine stands usually produce a much greater percentage of poles than do the other pine species. This is according to the website msucares.com. In our feature segment today, a Farm Week flashback from nine years ago. Harris Barnes of Clarksdale, Mississippi spent more than 50 years as a farmer and an agricultural photojournalist. He had the rare opportunity to put together a collection of his life's memories and achievements in pictures. In 2002, he published his first book, Cotton, A 50-Year Pictorial History. Sadly, Barnes passed away at the age of 87, a little more than three years after the story first aired. He managed, however, to publish two more books before he died. Farm Week's Brian Utley reports. Farmers are just good people, period, you know, salt of the earth and uh, they're not uh, spoiled by too many riches. <laughs> Harris Barnes knows farmers. He knows agriculture, and in particular, he knows cotton. Well, this certainly passes a test. My dad, who was the old county agent here for 33 years, you know, said that you got a good cotton crop when on the 4th of July you can't see a rabbit running across the field. So yes, this certainly meets those specs right there. The 84-year-old Barnes has spent a lifetime immersed in agriculture, both as a farmer and as a photojournalist. He spends his time these days promoting his new book called Cotton at book signings like this one in Indianola. Barnes says cotton is a tribute to his lifelong love affair with a plant that has always been much more than a crop and more of a culture. Yes, sir. It's a 50-year history of cotton from the hand chopping days to, to the present. Fresh out of the Marines in 1944, Harris returned from World War II to become the farm manager at Connell & Company Ball Plantation in Clarksdale. It was there that he picked up the skill of photography from Billy Connell, whom the book is dedicated to. During the late 40s and early 50s, Ball Plantation was on the cutting edge of farm technology, the first in the area to use a mechanical cotton picker and the first to use herbicides. Barnes soon found out to his delight that equipment companies and agricultural publications were willing to pay for his pictures of their advanced farm practices. So I was amazed that some of them would give me $25 or $50 for a black and white print. I was, you might say, moonlighting on some of my jobs as farm managers because I was writing in the thick of it and every time I saw a good picture I'd try to capture it. So thank the Lord I started saving pictures back in 46. He not only takes good pictures, 
but he understands agriculture. He's done it all. He knows what we're trying to do, and he knows good farming when he sees it, and knows bad farming when he sees it. And I think his years as a farm manager and running a large operation really is the reason he can tell such a good story in his photography. As his skill in photography developed, so did his hand in journalism. In the 1960s, Barnes began writing a column for Progressive Farmer, among other farm publications, which led to a successful career as a freelance agricultural photojournalist. This is one of my favorites, too. Uh, this was on the cover of Progressive Farmer in about 1957 or 58, and it shows uh, three heights of trailers, three colors of trailers, and four kids, all of them wearing 100 percent cotton. When I first saw Mr. Barnes's book on cotton, it brought back feelings from when I was a little girl, jumping in a cotton trailer, things that are those memories that were captured in that book that I don't know where else they would be captured. My wife used to call that a turnaround picture. I'd be driving down the highway and I'd see something that really strike me. And sometimes I'd meditate on it for five miles or something. I, I'd go back, I said, I gotta have that picture and I'd turn around and... This is as pretty a cotton as you'll see right here. And I looked at this old house and the sun was on it, the Lord was just beaming real good on it. I said, there's my book right there, that's the whole thing, the old and the new, because this is exactly, when I started farming, this is exactly the kind of houses and tenant families that we had, but this is the old and the new personified right here in this hill. It's his experiences with old-time cotton production, as well as modern ways and means, that bring many area producers to call on his wealth of information. Johnny Larson says he thinks of Harris as a father figure relying on his expert advice for many of his important farming decisions. Harris Barnes just knows more about agriculture, certainly here in the Mid-South, uh, than anyone I know. And he has such a broad uh, range of knowledge. Uh, he knows all about mules, and, he, and now he knows all about 12-row equipment. And so uh, he, is, uh, he is the ace. He's the expert here. In agriculture, like every other profession, whether it's communications or medicine or whatever it is, has had great advancements over the last 50 years, but I don't know of any, anything that's had more than the production of cotton. This book captures an era that's gone and that we are so lucky to have him still here telling us about it. A lot of the people who farmed uh, remember it, but they can't express it and they can't share that with them as well as Mr. Barnes has done. I, I think that's a treasure. Who better to preserve history than uh, Harris Barnes, not only the knowledgeable uh, agricultural expert, but the one who has photographed agriculture uh, all his life. And uh, <clears throat> that book in particular is worth its weight in gold. Harris Barnes says retiring is the last thing on his mind. In fact, he actually has a second book in the works that will feature a variety of other crops in addition to cotton. While his lifelong collection of pictures will find its way into the hands of many Southerners, the historical value of the book alone makes it a document worthy of every library and museum in cotton country. From Clarksdale, I'm Brian Utley reporting. And you can watch this story on Harris Barnes again on our Farm Week website, our Facebook page, or YouTube. Our website address is farmweek.msucares.com. The last time I spoke with Mr. Barnes' son, Dudley, he did, have three, he did have copies of all three books, but that may have changed. We will have Dudley's contact information on our Farm Week webpage and our Facebook page. But in case you just joined us, uh, sadly, Mr. Barnes passed away in 2006. 
but he did publish two more books after Brian talked to him. So he did three books while he was in his 80s. I'll, I'll never do that. <laughs> he was a graduate of Mississippi State University. He served in the Marine Corps Reserve for 37 years, retiring as a colonel. Uh, in 2006, he donated more than 80 boxes of his photos to Mississippi State's Charm Agricultural History Collection. Uh, his cotton book won the 2004 Merit of Award from the Mississippi uh, Historical Society and the 2006 Mississippi Author Award from the Mississippi Library Association. He also served as the president of the American Soybean Association. And in 1967, Progressive Farmer Magazine named him as its Man of the Year in service to Southern agriculture. So, a full life. A full life, to, to say the least. And this is his uh, American beauty of Southern agriculture. And he was the editor of Southeast Farm Press for a while. And so that he did a lot of traveling in the Southeast. So that's where a lot of these pictures come from that he did. Uh, you know, in that beautiful Kodachrome look, for those of us who remember Kodachrome, you get that nice warm uh, colors out of there. So uh, he was the kind of guy that he just did it. And uh, American agriculture, particularly Southern agriculture, I think can be proud that he did because he carried the message and what was going on down here to the rest of the nation. Right. Well, we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, we're gonna have a feature story version of Farm Week. We will be giving you highlights of the Dixon National Sale of Junior Champions in Jackson. The sale made a dramatic change this year as it shifted from the old sale ring into the Mississippi trademark. You'll also cut trees with Harrison Logging of Grenada, Mississippi. It has a perfect safety record. And in Southern Gardening, we'll have some beautiful plants that thrive in hot conditions. For the rest of the Farm Rate crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll be back next week.